see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. This is the Rob Call Bottom Up Radio Show, WNJC 1360 AM, reaching Metro Philly and South Jersey out of Washington Township, sponsored by opednews.com. It's the first time I'm actually doing a video version of the show. I'm going to be doing it today with Edwin Rutsch. Edwin, it works with empathy, and he's been doing it for a couple of years. I think it's very interesting, important work, so I wanted to do an interview with him. Edwin, welcome to the show. Oh, great to be here with you, Rob. And tell me, what is it you're doing, and what's it about, and why do you do it? Well, what I have is the uh, Center for Building a Culture of Empathy. It's uh, here in the Bay Area is where I'm, I'm located. And the uh, website is cultureofempathy.com. And it's, a, it's an effort to foster empathy and compassion within society to basically make empathy uh, the foundational social value for basically you know, the United States and the world, for that matter. How does that compare to what is the foundational cultural value now? Well, one of the big uh, cultural values seems to be self and self-interest and uh, competition as well. If you look at the government, right, we've got a competitive uh, government, two parties, multiple parties competing with each other. Uh, we've got a justice system that's based on competition and the notion that we're all selfish, self-interested beings. Uh, just try, going for our own self-interest. And you, know, you can look at pretty much any institution, and they seem to be you know, based on, on those uh, foundational values. So how would a culture based on empathy change things? Well, empathy for me is really about connection. How do we connect with each other? So if you're wanting like specifics, uh, let's take a look at just the justice system, for example. We have a, a system where if someone has done harm to someone, you go into this justice system, which is kind of based on this gladiatorial uh, system where you have two lawyers that uh, see, you know, that, that kind of battle out uh, the conflict. And then someone wins, and, that, and we call that justice. And then uh, if we really change that uh, system to a more empathic system, it would really be about restoring connection between all parties, something you know more based around what would be the restorative justice, which I would call restorative empathy model, where it's really about reestablishing connection and deepening connection between everyone involved. I, I've uh, been long interested in the evolutional and anthropological uh, aspects of these kinds of things and I call the show the bottom up radio show because I think we're in a transition from a top down to a bottom up world one that will be hard fought but that's moving along uh, and I believe that before humans were civilized they were in a bottom up world for about a, at least a million years tribal indigenous cultures had bottom up very different connected relationships than civilization changed things to. So I wonder, have you looked at all at the anthropology of empathy? I haven't looked at the uh, anthropology of empathy, but a lot into the science of it. And there's a lot of new science coming out that really shows how we are basically wired for empathy, it's kind of like one of our basic foundational biological wirings to connect with other people. And you know, for for like you're saying, for maybe thousands of years, you know, the philosophers, the uh, you know, the, the scientists, or the culture was saying, well, everybody's in it for themselves, and we need this hierarchical structure, you know, top-down structure, like you're talking about. And this is the way things are. You know, we're all kind of greedy, selfish beings kind of competing. And we have to have this kind of this hierarchical system to kind of keep order. And it's, and like you're saying that we're, that, you know, in, in uh, you know, tribal uh, small communities, the community would get together and maybe a circle and kind of talk about what was, you know, what was going on for them uh, and kind of resolve uh, conflicts. Uh, and so the biology, the, the science, you know, for a long time, the scientists have said there's a selfish gene. We're all in it for ourselves again, as I've been saying. But now with the, like the, the, uh, 
discovery of mirror neurons that really show that we are wired for empathy. And the foundation of, of mirror neurons is that when we see an action or do an action, the same neurons fire in our brain. So if uh, I'm yawning, uh, there's certain neurons that are firing my, in my brain. And if I see you yawn, actually those same neurons fire in my brain as well. And then you're yawning. Now. <laughs> and I, oh, I'm starting to yawn too. And you're laughing. Now I'm seeing you smile because we're here on Skype with video and I'm seeing you smile. And the neurons inside me are kind of like smiling as well. So it's just, you know, there's, and so I can feel the emotion that's going on inside you and you're feeling the emotion that's going on inside me. And we can't help but do it because we're wired to be that way. And that's kind of like the one of the foundational, you know, building blocks of empathy. And there's all, all kinds of, if you say like anthropology and biology of like, how did, why did this come about? You know, because we're social beings and we work as a group and, you know, we need that empathy to, to work and function together. It's not only seeing a person it can also be just thinking about it or visualizing it. It can also ac activate the, the mirror neuron, neurons too. Yeah. It's that, it's that powerful. Yeah, it's, it's uh, here, you know, so all the senses, all the senses can bring that together. The, the, you know, the touch, the, the hearing, the smelling, the, the seeing, the, even the imaginative, even imagining. So, you know, you imagine something, you imagine your, just remember, you know, some warmth that you felt maybe with your mother, you know, some kind of caring, nurturing feeling. And it just, it fills your body. It activates those, just the remembrance, remembering that event. You can feel it in your body. Well, let's, let's take a step back uh, to, to, to really make sense of this. Uh, perhaps you should start talking about a definition of empathy. What, what do you mean by empathy? Yeah, the, well, the, the most common definition is uh, kind of the metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes and looking through someone else's eyes. And uh, that's what, you know, most people will kind of use. But I, going into kind of more depth, even the, you know, the scientists kind of, and the academics kind of have different definitions of, you know, what empathy is. But for, for me, I would say empathy is like four parts to empathy. And the first part is self-empathy, which is sensory awareness of what's going on inside of ourselves. Like, you know, if I'm looking at you and, and I'm wondering, like, what's going on inside your body? What are you feeling, you know, inside your body? And that's kind of like the first step. The second step is kind of a mirrored empathy, which is what we were just talking about, is that through mirror neurons, Kind of connecting the the more space we have inside of ourselves the more open we are the more open we are to seeing and feeling other people uh, through the mirror neuron process the third part i would call imaginative empathy which is actually what you touched on is that if we can kind of put ourselves almost like actors into someone else's shoes and take their perspective or even imagine uh an event and kind of kind of feel what that's like. So I can give you a scenario as an actor and say, okay, you're you're homeless, you're you're destitute. What does that feel like to you? And you can actually put yourself in their shoe, in the, in those that person's shoes, and imagine what it's like, and actually act out that that experience. And then the fourth part would be empathic action which is uh, as we see our common humanity, you know, as you and I get closer and more connected and I see what your deeper feelings and values are, that we kind of hold those values together. We're, we're kind of like connected. We hold our common humanity together and we act out of that humanity and for our mutual well-being it's like we're it's almost like for me it seems like we're basically wired that when we connect with someone at a deep level we automatically want uh uh to contribute to their well-being and that's what i would call empathic action okay let me throw a couple things at you first of all uh it is it, we're not only wired it's wireless uh and what i mean by that is a couple um Good number. I, I used to run a conference on the brain, mm -hmm. 
And, and one of the presentations that was done was done by Gary Schwartz. He's at the University of Arizona. He put two people in the same room and measured both of their uh, EKGs and, and brainwave activity, their EEGs. And what he found was that he could detect in one person, in one person's brain activity, the electrical activity in the brain, the EKG of the person sitting nearby. The EKG generates an energy field that touches the other person. So when you talk about connected, if you talk about radio frequency energy, people are connected. We're touched in, in an energetic way. Uh, he did this research with the help of a $10 million grant from the NIH, too. So, uh, so it was taken it's, seriously. So it's how we're connected. You're saying there's some kind of some kind of force that connects us at a kind of a biological level where we're picking up each other's uh, energy and. It's simple science. The EKG, the heart, generates an electrical an electromagnetic signal that creates a field. Fields generate out from the body. I'm sure it generates for yards, maybe even longer, and the brain actually reflects that electric it can actually be detected if you pick up the brainwave activity of somebody else I mean that's how much of a connection there are there really is between us all it's it's a very tangible measurable connection between us the other thing is uh, uh, I've done a lot of work uh, in the world of positive psychology uh, back in the 80s I got very interested in <clears throat> I learned that, that people, when they think of a heartwarming experience, it almost always involves somebody else. But also, uh, when people think of it, their physiology goes in the right direction. And I really, there was no research back then on what happens when somebody has that heartwarming experience. So I started looking at facial expression and uh, looking at smile activity. And, and, and other facial expressions. The, the, the grand master of that is Paul Ekman uh, in the San Francisco area. If you've, if you've ever had any contact. Have you had any contact I've interviewed. With him? I have an hour-long interview you, with him on the website. Really? Yeah. Oh, I'd love to. I have to check that one out. Uh, I got into it, and, and where I went with it was one way I empathize with people is I replicate their facial expressions. Mm. I try them on for size. That's more than just looking at them. It's literally when you see somebody walking around with an unusual expression, whether it's a great smile or pursed lips or an unhappy look, uh, try it on. Because sometimes it'll tell you more about how they're feeling than you could ever know just by looking at them. Yeah, that's that. That's the uh, that's that resonance part. The uh, mirrored empathy is that you can you're you're looking at others and you're you're taking your mirror neurons what you're kind of feeling and then you're actually taking it a step farther and actually changing your face to mirror what they're doing you're creating that uh, empathic uh, resonance with them exactly you know it's it's really kind of fun to do that sometime when you're in a traffic jam uh-huh <laughs> Yeah, when people are yelling and screaming at each other. <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. Uh, or, or they're talking on, sometimes they're just talking on the phone. Uh -huh. but it's, it's, uh, it's kind of borrowing an experience almost. It's very interesting. But it lets you kind of get into people's heads in a way that you never could otherwise. So, uh, yeah, I've okay. done that. I've done that in dance. I do kind of this freestyle dance like every week. This is really where I get all this emotional, you know, energy and, and actually in the dance, I'll do that is whatever the person is doing, you know, they're moving, I will mirror what they're doing. And it's like, sometimes they'll even notice that I'm trying, and what I'm saying to myself is I really want to get who you are. I really want to know who you are. I really want to feel who you are. It, whatever it is, and what it, what it is you're trying to say through your body. And I just want to feel it and get it. And so I'll mirror them and Sometimes they'll say, oh, they'll see that I'm trying to mirror it, and they're, they're going really fast and they can see that I'm not keeping up and they'll slow down so that I can kind of get in sync. And it's almost like this shifting of the gears. These gears get into, into together and we really start 
really almost become like a third body, a third consciousness where we're really connected. And then the creativity really happens where they will do a movement and I'll take that energy and I'll play with it. And, and then, you know, I'll add another movement. And so there's a real creative, you know, synchroni synchronicity that kind of happens. It's so much fun and so pleasurable. And that synchronization, like when you get into that synchronization, I think it's like, that's when the body releases oxytocin. And that oxytocin is kind of that anti-stress hormone. It's the uh, it's the neuropeptide that uh, women have when they give birth, uh, when they're um, nursing, and it's a it's a big stress reliever. So when you're mirroring people there in their faces, you're actually kind of releasing maybe a little bit of that, uh, oxytocin and kind of uh, relaxing a little bit. Um, I'm, you know, I'm looking away because I, I have on my bookshelf here a book that just came out about how oxytocin is a connection hormone. It's, it's the uh, drug that the body releases that connects people together, that it is associated with love and affection. Is that The Moral Molecule by Paul Zak? Um, you know, I think it is. Yeah, yeah, that's it. You got it too. I got it here somewhere too. I just like I did an interview with yeah. him as well. So we had a great. He's a really fun person to talk with. Yeah, he's he's on my list too. <laughs> yeah. So, well, where does that fit in? Tell me more about oxytocin then. Well, oxytocin is uh, it's kind of like the benefit that we get. It, it's something. It's like nature's way of saying, "Hey, it's really important that you connect with others." You know, it's like. It's like uh, we're stressed, we're feeling disconnected. When we get disconnected, right, you feel isolated, you feel alone. And then the body is like uh, releasing the stress hormone, this pain, like, like we're lonely, it's painful. And then, you know, someone that you know and love comes to you and is with you and, and you feel that warmth and that connection. And that warmth and that connection is the body, you know, releasing that oxytocin, which is kind of filling your body with kind of that warm, fuzzy uh, kind of feeling. So, and, you know, there's all kinds of health benefits to that too. For, you know, you hear of people who have more social connection, they live longer, you know, you feel better, you have, you know, just all kinds of good stuff. So, now, one of your goals that we've talked about is you're looking to figure out how to get more empathy happening between different political ideologies. I'm not sure I'm saying it right, but so you say it. Yeah, it's um, it's really about how right, our present uh, political system is we have, you know, the progressives, the conservatives, Democrats, Republicans, and all kinds of other parties, everybody competing. Um, it's almost like a dysfunctional, you know, family or dysfunctional marriage. And there's all kinds of stress. People are really pissed off. And uh, it's just, it's not working very well. And what we're needing is someone to kind of go in with a, just like in a, in a dysfunctional marriage is you have the, a mediator or a counselor that is saying, okay, come together. You're mad at each other. You kind of offer empathy. I mean, if I don't know if you've done mediation, Rob, or done any kind of training, but it's like, you know, you kind of empathize with both sides. Uh, you know, you kind of help them get their stress down, get a little, they, they, once they start, people start feeling heard, you know, their stress goes down, that oxytocin gets released, they get calmer. And then as a mediator, you turn the parties to each other and have them dialogue and start trying to create an empathic uh, connection between the two of, of them. So that's kind of just basic foundational, you know, uh, mediation kind of processes. So what I feel is we need is actually a uh, an empathy party movement that is kind of like the role of the uh, mediator. But it's not just a mediator who says, we're going to bring you and have you talk with each other. And then you then we're going to send you back out into this competitive you know, stressful social structure. It's saying we're that we're mediators. We're for empathy. We're for a culture of empathy, and we want to transform all of society so that the social structures and social institutions nurture, foster empathy within society, and that we make empathy kind of this foundational 
uh, social value. So it means um, within politics, and we, we talked about that, let's get some, let's get people from different uh, political persuasions, get them together and actually start talking about how we can connect with each other with, with, uh, through empathy and how can we together have more empathic connection and uh, you know, work together to foster empathy. And, and I've been doing this, going to the uh, Tea Party rallies here in San Francisco, went to the California State Republican Convention, uh, asking Republicans about empathy, to the Democratic Convention, talking to them about empathy. And now I've talked with you about, let's get a, a panel together you know, via Skype and see if we can dialogue with some progressives, uh, green party members, libertarians and conservatives around this. You know, it's interesting. If you look at my body language, I've kind of shifted and tightened up my shoulders a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've, I've been thinking about it as you're saying it, and I've been thinking about my interactions, and I can have, without any problem, a non-contentious conversation with a Tea Partier. And I can find agreement. Uh, neither of us like Obama. Uh, and uh, neither of us like Congress. Uh, there are things you can agree on. But when it comes down to it, there are so many things that we don't agree on that are the ones that I think that polarize us. Uh, that's the challenge. That's why my shoulders kind of went back. And uh, Yeah, I remember when we were talking about this beforehand, I, I said, well, let's put a panel together. And I said, well, do you know some Republicans that we can bring together? And it was like a pause. <laughs> well, well, <yeah. laughs> it's like, like, it didn't sound like you had a lot of Republican friends. You said, well, I think I might have one. In it. Well, so, you know, you can pick your friends. You, 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 you can't pick your relatives. So, you know, oh. I have some relatives. I have some relatives. Uh, I have some old friends, you know, like college buddies who have uh, uh, fallen along the wayside or, you know, are still into Ayn Rand. You know. <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, you, you were talking about agreement. You can have agreement with kind of like a common enemy, right? It was like, oh, we both don't like Obama. I mean, there's kind of like you can always you can kind of create this sense of empathy you know, bonding by having a common enemy, but really, you know, I'm looking at, we need to get rid of even that enemies, you know, that Obama's the enemy or, or whoever is, is like some kind of an enemy or we don't like, or, you know, it's like, for me, at least, it's like, let's stop demonizing the government. You know, it's like for conservatives are saying, you know, government is bad. There's all these people in government that they're bad. And, you know, it's all, that we need to stop that demonization. We need to stop demonize, demonizing corporations and just kind of get rid of the whole demonization and really start seeing the common yeah, but, humanity between everyone. But wait a second. What you just described was the liberal progressive point of view, the Democrats' point of view. And if you suggest that to a Tea Party person, they're going to tell you to go screw yourself. Because basically you're asking them to get rid of what is most important to them. Demonizing government is one of their biggest uh, issues. So, and, and, and protecting corporations, they've been persuaded that that's a major issue for them. So that's where I see this as such a challenging thing. Now, I, I agree with you. Stop demonizing. That's a good place to start. Start finding some positive directions to move towards. But I haven't heard any from you yet that are positive. Some positive ways of moving forward? No, some positive areas to focus on that both sides can agree on. I just, the, it's really hard. Yeah, I, it's like you're not hearing like a concrete kind of a, something you can kind of sink your teeth into or something. Well, the, I, the example you gave, I think, uh, would, would, wouldn't work, frankly. I think it's just directly attacking, uh, you know, say, don't, don't demonize the stuff that you care so much about and hate so much. You know, yeah, well, like, what I say is I don't support it. I don't support the demonization. And I think what we need to do is build the culture of empathy where we all, where we work towards, you know, in an ongoing fashion to foster or nurture empathy within society. And how do we do that? You know, it's like in one way is dialogue. You know, we bring people together from different points of view and have them really dialogue about what's important to them. Like, it's not about the policies. 
Uh, it's about what are the underlying values that are important to you. For example, Rob, like what's your most important value to you personally? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll put it this way. What's most important to me is my family, the people I love, okay? Taking care of them and making, doing what I can to, so that I leave them a world that is a better place than I came into, that where there's justice and fairness and freedom and uh, those are the and 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 a, and a clean environment with biodiversity. Uh, some of the real core basics, and I think maybe maybe the environment. If you don't go into global warming, because that's a, a hot button issue, uh, I I think if if we talk about taking care of children, that might be one. Uh, if 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 we talk about supporting education and come up with some common grounds there. I mean, there are areas that I think that we can come up with that, that, that we, but you got to stay away from the, the demonization um, mountains, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like family is your most important value then in the, in the connection that you have within family is, is what I was hearing. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, and my kids. Well, I went, I went to the Republican state convention here, as I mentioned, and I was talking to some, you know, asked some of the conservatives there what their most important value was, and it was family as well. So, I mean, there's some common ground, just the sense of connection within family. Yeah, yeah, I, I think that could be a, an effective way to find those common grounds, because I think finding common ground, I think, is a key element of connecting and the empathy that you're talking about wouldn't you agree yeah it's it's finding those deeper underlying values that 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 we connect on that create that resonance that empathic resonance and where we can see our our humanity like for me um it's really you know i i grew up a conservative uh you know in an evangelical conservative household and uh, you know, Baptist. Uh, and then I went uh, traveling for like 10 years, traveling around the world. Like kind of my value at the time was I was seeing myself as a seeker, as a quester, you know, for kind of like truth and, and the meaning of life. And that, <coughs> excuse me, I, and, and that kind of my religion kind of faded away. And I kind of went more towards, you know, the progressive side of, uh, of politics and that, and, and I had a lot of conflict with my with my family because they're all Republican, conservative, evangelical, and we'd have these knockdown, drag out fights, you know, about how how things should be. And uh, you know, there's a lot of pain, a lot of connect, disconnection within that. But now I don't try to convert them or any to you know like a political point of view. I try to listen and empathize with what it is that's what it is that that is important to them. And then, you know, if I hear it, it's like they see the world as being very unempathic and that people don't care about each other. And I don't, and I just listen to it and I reflect it and I try to, you know, hear the deeper underlying, uh, you know, values that they have. And our connection is so much better, you know, between them and myself. So I have kind of like a real interest in this political you know, divide to really, you know, to, uh, I don't know, to transform that and, and uh, you know, to find the way of making connection because it has like a personal feel, you know, for me. I think it's really important because uh, especially this election with Facebook, with more people on Facebook and engaged in it than ever before, uh, if you look at, <clears throat> just if you look at social media, uh, they just were showing some stats uh, Four years ago, the Republican convention had about 350,000 tweets. This, this year, it was over 5 million. So 10 times the social media connection of the previous election. Now, what's happening on Facebook is people are putting their stuff up, and relatives are seeing it. Mm. And they're on the other side of the divide often. <clears throat> and it's getting ugly. It's getting nasty. And... I, uh, uh, I, I've made a point of not pushing stuff to the conservative family members that I have. Can I have them? And 
um, it's a challenge. My brother's a conservative. I've got a couple cousins who are conservatives. And, uh, you know, they look at my website. That's opednews.com. Uh, and if they look at it, it's going to really piss them off. Mm-hmm. Because it, it's very hard-edged, progressive, left of liberal, left of Democrat opinion. And uh, so I sure don't want to send it to them, and I can't stop them from looking at it. And every now and then, they'll send stuff to me. Now, some of them, i uh, got one who uh, is an angry conservative, who, and, uh, but the others, you know, they try to throw data or facts at me, and that's the way I try to respond back myself. Because if you look at the hottest issues and you engage with the passion, that's just going to cause trouble. But it's a big problem. And I think that more than ever, what you're talking about doing is necessary. So do you have any advice or tips for people who are encountering this on Facebook or other places where they never did before, where they were able to follow the rules and avoid talking about religion, politics, and money with family? Well, the way the way I've been doing it is just trying to empathize and hear, you know what, and and it it takes a lot of grounding too. It's like, and you need to get your empathy battery charged yourself. Like, you know, growing up in a conservative environment, you know, I felt kind of like, uh, kind of unheard. You know, where, who I was was not heard, was not seen. And, it, you know, it, it then you kind of come out and you want to fight to kind of be heard and, you know, and kind of get into that, like, I will be heard, damn it, you know, kind of and it creates all kind of conflict. So what I find is that one is to create a culture of empathy, that we need to have community that is about empathy, that it, it's like kind of like that, re, what's called resilience in child development, the children who are seen and heard and held that they develop a sense of, of uh, self and a sense of grounding and a sense of, uh, you know, deep resilience in, term, in times of stress. And it's the same thing with building a culture of empathy. I feel we need to have a movement, an actual empathy movement that's outside of the progressives, conservatives, or any other, you know, party or movement. And that you we start building that resilience within ourselves that when we go into a, 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 a very difficult situation like you're talking about, that we actually em- have the, the, the capacity to empathize with what is going on for, for but, the people. But, so, yeah. But, but. but there's a challenge. And the challenge is the way the system is set up now, the way the two-party system is set up now, and the way it's manipulated by the media and the people behind the money, who uh, especially those who have been able to come forward since 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 united they're trying to do the exact opposite they're working at odds with what your intentions and goals are exactly at the opposite they want to polarize people they want to get them mad they want to get them scared yeah they want to get them disgusted they want them to feel contempt that's where they're going and that's what they're trying to do that's what shock radio, that's what right-wing radio is all about. That's what um, <clears throat> Rush Limbaugh is, is, lives to do every day, is to, to, to spew and generate and inspire hate and anger and contempt and disgust, the exact opposites of what you're talking about creating. So part of the challenge, I think, is to circumvent that to work around it to get past it to overcome it how does that happen yeah it's like uh it's like the the social structure the whole media structure seems to be kind of built around fostering and nurturing kind of fear and anxiety and and hate and and disconnection so like how do we go about uh, and paranoia and paranoia, paranoia is yeah I've, I've done some radio shows with people from from that that it's a lot of fun actually talking to them and and uh i think it, it's really empathy the means are the end or the end are the means that the way we do that is not to attack them because 
if if you attack someone who is is uh, kind of has that fear and that anxiety, all it does is reinforce it. It's like that's what's happening with progressives. Like MSNBC almost like reinforces the conservative uh, way of being, and they kind of become in. The, it's just like a, a marriage, right? It's like the 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 couple is just in total, you know, mad at each other, and they feel. They both feel self, you know, righteous about their way of being, and the other has harmed me, and and it just kind of keeps ratcheting up and ratcheting up, and just like with mediation, it all starts with empathy. That there's got to be uh, someone that is grounded in empathy and has that resilience that kind of can kind of hold the space and say and listen, not not try to argue with anyone, but actually listen and create that resonance of hearing. What is deep, that deep connection? Because, yeah, sorry, what were you going to say? Well, what you said a couple minutes ago was you need to be able to charge up, you need to be able to charge up your uh, empathy batteries. Yeah. And you, I think part of what you're saying is you have to enter into these kinds of dialogues, these connections with a kind of intention, an empathic intention. And that takes a level of consciousness and an awakening to the understanding that empathy is important. Now, what I'm hearing from you is it can be done in a one-sided way. Mm -hmm. Is it Now, it, it would also make sense then that it would be something that you might bring to the other party and is there a way that you've developed for raising the idea of engaging in a conversation with the intention of each sharing empathy because it seems to me if you both do that it's going to be more likely to succeed yeah but it's, it has to kind of start somewhere so i'm seeing that we need a group, a community that's really grounded in this, so that we have a starting point. Because we need, we each need to be heard and be empathized with. So I need it. And when I'm heard by others, you know, who are supporting, listening deeply, it's kind of grounding myself. Then when I go into difficult situations, like I went to the Republican state convention and I asked Republicans, you know, tell me, it was some several young kind of fraternity, young Republicans. And I said, well, tell me about your values. What's important to you? And, and one guy said, you know, protection. Anybody hurt me and my family, you know, we're going to protect ourselves. And so I just listened. I said, oh, so protection is important. You know, it's like, yeah, we're going to, you know, we're going to, you know, it didn't say the gun, but, you know, we got our guns, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing with protection. So I just listened, reflected, I heard. And then it was like, oh, so security is important to you. Yeah, we're going to, you know, we're... We got my friends, we got our guns, we got whatever. So, and then I said, so what you're concerned about is that there's people out there who will do you harm. And I have that same fear that people are going to do you harm. And those people are people who are not going to empathize with you because your friends aren't going to go break into your house because they empathize with you. They care about you. So what you're really concerned about is that there's people out there who aren't going to empathize with you and it might do you harm. So empathy is important. He says, yeah, I guess empathy is really important. <laughs> you know? So then, the, and I said, yeah, so what can we do together to foster more empathy? And then we were kind of like on the same page. We were both talking about empathy. And I, it, it was seeing the, the concerns, which are legitimate concerns about protection, about security, and the fears that people have. I and mean, we have to see that. We have to resonate with that. But then it's make the connection that most of the fears are really based on a fear of a lack of other people empathizing with us. And then there was, like I said, it was like three young Republicans there. And then one of the one of the the, the, the guys pulled out a you know a smartphone. He said, you know, a friend of mine, he was a real jerk and really self-centered and, and um you know, his mother was dying of cancer. And one of the last thing, things she did was uh, he, she wrote him this letter. And I have a copy of it on my, you know, smartphone. And he said, I'd like to read it to you. And he brought it out and he, he read, read it. And it, it said, 
you know, son, it's so important that you care about other people, that you think about other people, because you'll see in life, it's the most important thing. It's kind of like what you were talking about, right? At the end of your life, that's kind of what you experience. And he's, and then, you know, he read the whole thing and he said, this changed my friend's life. He's like totally turned around. His mother did die of cancer. And, um, but, it, but the point is, is that we started this dialogue about their val the value of protection, and it was by empathizing, by going deeper into what was you know going on for for this for this person about security and the fear of you know being harmed, and then making the connection to empathy that you know created this actually this uh, really beautiful uh, dialogue and that I had with with uh, with those uh, three. Uh, young Republicans. It's kind of like psychotherapy. Uh, mm -hmm. I um, I have some training as a counselor, and uh, you know, the first thing you do is build trust. You know, psychotherapy is is built on empathy. I think it was Carl Rogers. He did a study of different psychological, mm -hmm. you know, therapy models, and then to see how effective they were, and then it was like then he had just people off the street that were doing listening. Like all the models have something about listening. And then he took someone off the street who just did some empathic listening. And from his study, it's like there was all the same effect. Right. So it's like if you had that empathic listening, just somebody there to listen to you. I mean, it it's uh, it has the same effect. So for me, it's, it's like way beyond psychotherapy. You know, it's just about humanity and our basic, you know, human, you know, our biological, you know, need and capacity for empathy. Okay, so I want to move to another topic. Uh, and I, I, we talked about this the other day, too. Uh, the Dalai Lama has been advising people lately to engage in the practice of warm heartedness. And uh, when I first heard that, it really intrigued me because uh, I had written a book called The Happiness Response, and one of the working titles for the book had been uh, Heartwarming as a Verb. And uh, it got me intrigued with just the idea of what is warm heartedness? How do you practice warm heartedness? And so I started listening to more of what the Dalai Lama was saying and reading more of his material. Uh, and my impression is he's talking about love and compassion primarily. So I, I just wonder about your take on that whole idea. Well, we're kind of getting into maybe, you know, we talked about the definition of empathy and then how does empathy relate to compassion? And for me, there's different definitions of compassion, but for me, compassion is empathy applied to the suffering of someone else. It's kind of like a, a slice of the empathic experience. So I can empathize with all feelings, all emotions, all experiences. And then if I see see someone that is in suff that is suffering, that that's just one experience within the empathy experience, and that we call compassion. How do we relate with someone that's suffering? And typically, you know, the compassion part is that we have the, kind of this consoling uh, sense of wanting to console them. They're, they're in pain. Someone's in pain. And if you do a search like on compassion uh, uh, paint art, it, it's typically showing someone who's kind of in distress, you know, a soldier, a child, you know, someone that's down and out. And then there's a person with their arm over that person's shoulder, kind of consoling them and bringing that warmth and that sense of connection and that oxytocin uh, to them. And maybe what you're talking about with the, the, uh, the, with the Dalai Lama, it's the, the sense of that imagining, right? You imagine a, a time when you've uh, had deep connection and that warmth, and then that kind of brings it up in you, and you kind of bring that feeling to someone else. Is that kind of how you're seeing the that the the, the compassion it, part? I'm just kind of wondering how you're, what it is that you know how you're kind of seeing it. I think that it's possible to learn skills for 
happiness uh, that are based on positive experience. I think that if, if you can do that, if you can build your ability to have positive experiences with other people, then you can open your heart to them. And once you open your heart to people, that lets all kinds of good stuff happen. Now, to do that, you've got to have enough trust to, you to let down your guard. And that's a key element of it, too, I think. And I think that's exactly what you've been talking about. And you've described your encounters with conservatives when you've gone to these different locations. You basically start a dialogue with them, show them that you are human like them, help to find their humanity that you can then recognize and then that helps them to open their hearts to you, which and you've already taken, you've already made a conscious choice to open your heart. Yeah. So it's that opening yourself that the more we can reveal about ourselves, it's it's like that uh, self empathy that we as we open ourselves, that it creates space for others to kind of to come in and and to open themselves as well. So it's almost like I, 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 it help, it's helpful for me to think about this one cousin I have. He's very angry and hates Obama and um, has gotten into some arguments with some people. And, and I don't want to argue with people. You know, people have made their minds made up. And, and I have family who are conservative who I love. And I don't really think I'm going to change their minds. So, you know, the challenge is how do you stay connected to them? And still respect what they disagree with me on. How does that happen? And I think that's it, it, it's how do we build connections, relationships, community around the areas that are the, the, the problem ones, the idea of the oyster creating a pearl out of. Uh, this, what it covers the sand with, the irritant of the sand with, uh, comes to mind. It's almost like we've got to build good stuff that goes around the crap that has been partially created and fed and stimulated by the hate machine that's out there on both sides. Yeah. There's so much pain and ang anxiety and fear already in the environment. And it's like, how do we kind of address that? So it's almost like we've got to, it, it, whether it's directly confront it and say it or think it and, and engage in it intentionally without saying it, we've almost got to engage with somebody who we disagree with, with the idea, let's attempt to consciously find common ground, find the edges where, we're, where there is discomfort and friction and work around them because they're probably just a small part of each of our humanity. Yeah, I, I would start with the, the part of the, the culture of empathy. For me, it's like a grounding touchstone, that that is the intention. Is We need to have the, the grounding intention that that is the underlying value that we want to foster within society. And then we start looking for ways you know, all the little ways, the step-by-step -step ways that we can nurture that. But we well, you know, I'll tell you, one of the things that got me looking at anthropological aspects of, of this, these phenomenon was I learned about a tribe that existed in the Far East uh, called the Sinoi. S -N I think it's S-N-G-O-I, Sinoi. And... They lived in the forest, and they shared their dreams, and they based the daily decisions of their lives on their dreams. They were very intuitive and very sensitive to each other. It just seems to me that this is what you're looking for, a culture of empathy, is not something that has to be invented that was never there before. I, I've got to believe that because of what we've already discussed in terms of mirror neurons and oxytocin and the nature of humans and what we can be, that that culture has already existed and maybe it even now exists 
in some indigenous, one of the several thousand indigenous tribal cultures that are remaining on this planet. And I would encourage you to, to explore that a bit uh, with anthropologists, because it may be that, that we've already got a model to learn from. Well, we have a lot of empathy. Empathy is kind of like the glue that's holding society together. I mean, here in the United States, it's not like, uh, you know, Rwanda at the time of, you know, the, the, the mass murders or something or Cambodia or so. Is that, right. what, it, is that what it looks like when empathy disappears? <clears throat> For me, that's that's like the ultimate. I mean, that's right. The concentration Nazi Germany, the concentration camps. I mean, that is that's the other pole. I mean, that's like the. And we have two poles and and uh, we can go totally into that kind of a world. And that's still at any point the possibility if we don't nurture and foster and create the, you know, the social structures and the, and the grounding in empathy. So there's already a huge amount of empathy within the United States and with it around the world. I mean, I see it all the time. I mean, I just see people connecting and the love and the connection and and the compassion, you know, everywhere. It's just, how do we really even expand it more? How do we? You think the internet is helping? It's been good for uh, for organizing and connecting around this. We're starting a, a you know, start an empathy party movement. We're having weekly. Uh, meetings for doing empathy circles. We have small groups and the, the intention of the group is to create a culture of empathy. And we each bring our stories, like you, know, you can bring your story of your relative, like where are you in your in your quest to create a culture of empathy? What problems are you having? What uh, successes are you having? What explorations are you doing? And you bring those stories and you are empathized with, you are heard about those. And that kind of gives, I'm seeing this bringing energy to people to then go out and, you know, take the next step. Then they try to take some empathic action. You come back, you're heard about, you know, your work. And then so to create kind of like a, an engine for building a culture of empathy. Okay, so you're talking about specifically about using the web uh, to build the empathy culture. I was kind of wondering... You know, in general, you know, uh, you've got billions of people using the web, um, you know, close to a billion on Facebook alone. Uh, what I've learned is that um, groups like Meetup have enabled people who wouldn't normally connect with each other to find each other. So people can find people with mutual interests that are unusual. Like a couple of, back when Meetup was getting started, they learned that one of the most popular Meetup groups that were happening around the country were pagans interested in witchcraft. And that's because they couldn't easily find each other normally. Uh, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I wonder, on the one hand, it seems that the internet could be helpful to help directly with what your efforts are. But there's this idea of siloing of ideas and information where people tend to talk to their to others who think the same way and in that way the internet can make things even worse because it can intensify uh, hyper focus the connections that people have so that can be a risk as well I would think yeah it's kind of that in group it's creating these in groups and out groups and you create your own world and your own reality so you're disconnected and you don't even connect with others which is kind of an anti -em empathy kind of way of being and so to build a culture of empathy we need to move across those barriers and those boundaries and go to the Tea Party rally go to the Occupy. Go to the Republican. Go to the go to the uh, to the Democratic conventions. You know, bring, and then do some panel discussions. Bring the, the different folks together to have a discussion about how do we nurture and foster empathy. So we really need to, yeah, not just sing to the uh, choir. I can't imagine either Democrats or the Republicans doing it at their convention, and I have a hard time imagining it imagining it, it happening at some of the other political events that I've gone to. But it's possible. Well, you I, know, I, maybe the, 
maybe at different events that are not political is the place for it to happen. You know, I just posted something on our Facebook uh, page, a uh, quote by Barack Obama. He said, let us reject the impulse to harden ourselves to others' suffering and instead make a habit of empathy, of recognizing ourselves in each other and expanding or extending our compassion to those in need. So he's spoken, you know, quite a bit uh, about the importance of empathy. And now I'm seeing your your brow furrow and <laughs> thinking. I'm thinking of uh, Guantanamo and uh, some of the other uh, intentions he's had or expressed that haven't happened. But yeah, it's a the good. The words are good. The words are good. Uh, we've got to wrap up here. Um, it's been a very interesting conversation that is. Uh, by its nature, one that's not going to come to any simple conclusions. So, do you, are there any links? What's your Facebook uh, page? Well, and you what's think, your website? Yeah, the website, the main way to get to it is cultureofempathy.com, and everything kind of links off of that. Okay. Great. Great talking to you, Rob. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.